Hello everyone, here we are with Talamander number one. So I'm quite excited to actually do this. Let's just go into this. I've already done out the catch We've got the pens near me, we've got the dice. But let's just uh, go into this a little bit more before we actually start. So we don't start with any weapons. Uh, we don't have any. We just have whatever clothes we've got on our back. We can only carry 12 items. Uh, we have certain save points that we can do throughout the chapters. If we need to stop for a bit, we have code words just like in Fabled Lands. Now we have family luck. Uh, you've always been lucky. It's something you've inherited. Once per adventure, you can automatically pass a skill roll without rolling two dice. Choose wisely. So we need to make a note of that. I will probably forget. Um, reputation points, we start with zero. Combat-wise, it's pretty much like fighting fantasy, where you roll two dice for yourself, two dice for them. You add your individual attack points to your roll, and whoever rolls highest, they get two damage. Unless you happen to do a critical hit, which is where you roll two of the same number. It doesn't matter which number. As long as it's two of the same, you will get... You'll be doing four damage. But we don't start with anything. Uh, healing potions we can use at any time except combat. And they're stored in our backpacks. So they will take one of the 12 slots. Uh, there is also bonus sections, which I thought was really cool. So this applies only to illustrations that relate to the paragraph you are reading. There may be a number hidden in plain sight within the drawing. If there is, turn to that number for a special section to be revealed. And we've already sorted out our starting score. So, our skills, we automatically start with Attack 5, Health 15, Agility 5, Luck 5, and Perception 5. But we get 12 points that we can spend across these. Now, the main thing is that our maximum is up to 10, or for our health, it is already at 15. And we can basically spread these out, and they're going to be our starting score. So, I added uh, some points to Perception. To, I, I kind of spaced my... I know that I definitely wanted to attack in a decent Perception. And just to add a little bit to the extras for agility and luck. So without further ado, let's start this off. So let's start with the prologue. You watch your home burn. The raiders came in the night without warning and killed your family. A clubbed blow to the side of your head meant you were left dead. When you awake, the raiders are gone and your life is aflame. Despair takes you, and you watch helpless, as the only home you've ever known is reduced to ashes. Then you notice a movement at the corner of your eye. It's your mother, and she's alive. You stumble to her side. She lies motionless in the tall grass, battered and bleeding heavily from an ugly sword wound. Thang Mountain Raiders. They were looking for your father. Find him. She shudders and dies. You feel numb. It's all too much to bear, but your mind is racing. Your father died when you were young, or so you've always been told. A cold anger grows inside you, and you look north towards Fang Mountain, home of the raiders and other unspeakable evils. Why did the raiders kill your family? What does your father have to do with it? And is he still alive? You want answers, and you want vengeance. You vow the raiders will answer for what they've done. It seems an impossible task, but you have nothing left to lose. As the sun rises, you place a simple wooden marker on the grave of your family and head north towards Fang Mountain. I absolutely love this piece, though, by the way. There we go, chapter one. Uh, a day of walking takes you to the imposing stone city walls of Winterheart. You remember your mother had hidden emergency supplies in the hollow of a nearby tree. It's not hard to find, and you take out a rolled up backpack and pull it over your shoulders. While following the dusty track towards Fang Mountain, you don't look back. So add these items to your adventure sheet. So we have a so we have two healing potions, which gives us plus four. We have a frayed hunting sling, a bedroll. We have clothwise, we have rags with no bonus. We have a rusty dagger, which is a plus one to damage, and we get 20 bronze pieces. The morning is overcast but warm and you settle into an even stride. 
At midday, you forage for something to eat and make a meal of mushrooms and berries. You also bring down a rabbit using your sling. Not wanting to attract unattentioned attention with a fire, you eat it raw. Keep your mind occupied. You spend the afternoon looking out for suitable stones for your hunting sling. Add 10 stones to your hunting sling bag. Day of walking takes you to the imposing stone city walls of Winterheart. A bored guard watches you through hooded eyes. You must look aside. A purpling bruise on your forehead, blood-stained, torn and blackened clothing. But he's clearly seen worse as he doesn't stop you. In a daze, you hear people going about their daily business. Friendly chatter and laughter surround you. It's as if you've dreamt the last day and night. By the time you reach the market, most of the stores are packing up for the day, but you still have time to make some quick essential purchases before finding somewhere to sleep. You favour a sword on a nearby stall only, only to be grabbed by the scruff of the neck by the stall holder. Oi! No beggars! If you ain't got money, don't get me goods greasy. You reach down for your money pouch to show him your intent, but it's gone. The stall holder releases you and stepping back, you cast your eyes left and right. You feel a lump in your throat. All the money you had in the world. The final gift from your mother. Gone. Just then you see him, a young lad in rags. Not much better off than you, swinging your coin purse as he weaves between merchants. Remove 20 <laughs> bronze pieces from your adventure sheet. You just lost 20 bronze pieces. So we can either chase after him or call out to a pair of nearby guards for help. Now, we're going to go after him. We're going to turn to 12. I'm not going to... Have that happen. No, 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 no. Enough bad stuff's happened to us. You run after him. Anger boils over and you shout out at the thief, startling a passerby carrying a bundle of wood. He yelps and showers sticks and branches all over the cobbled road. Bloody adventures and you're shouting. Who's going to help pick this lot up? Says the express peasant. Will you help him pick up the wood or ignore him and continue the chase? No, I'm going to continue the chase. Turn to 69. This may be bad for us, to be honest. You follow the thief down a dark alley, just in time to see him scale the back wall and disappear through the open window of a tall brick building. He's agile and quick. You need all your skills to keep up. Roll two dice. I'm going to be using blue because it's in clarity. <laughs> roll two dice. If you roll equal or under your agility, turn to 77. Equal or under, our agility is 7. And for the first time ever, I roll above. If it's over, turn to 81. Maybe this is good. Maybe this is our thing. No, it's not good. You mistime your jump and manage to headbutt the brick wall. Lose two health. Fantastic. So our health now is at 13. Dazed, you hoist yourself up, dive through the window headfirst and tumble and crash over pots and pans. A slightly undignified entrance, but you're in one piece and the thief is only just ahead of you moving quickly out the only door in the bare brick room you find yourself in. He stops, grins at you, then carries on running. You get the feeling this is just a game to him. Turn to 25. It's evident that the building you're in is home to many people. Each room is inhabited by multiple family groups, human, dwarfs, and even orcs. You race up two flights of dusty stairs, weaving around small children, laughing and playing. Ahead, the thief darts through a curtain into another room. You follow. A startled old woman preparing a meal shrieks as you barge into a living room and drops the pot she has been holding, showering the floor in an assortment of green leaves. The thief just ahead steps out a window and, using a washing line as a tightrope, deftly steps across the gap to the building on the other side of the alley. You apologise to the old woman who shouts several curses at you in several different languages. At the window, you look down. It's a long drop, but several ideas spring to mind. So, we could use the same washing line as a tightrope. Or, we can look up to see more washing lines. You could put one down and try to swing into the room opposite. Or, step back and jump. I think the best thing is, I'm going to say, is put the washing line and hope to swing in. So, turn to one, two... Three. Using your sword, you cut one end of a line, wrap it around your wrist and leap. Roll two dice. If you roll equally or under your agility, you swing safely. Roll two dice. Okay, let's just do it. Our agility is seven. 
Why am I rolling so well for the first time when I need to not roll as well? If you roll equal or under your agility and swing safely across the gap, under your agility, swing safely across the gap and step into the building opposite. The total rolled is over. You let go of the rope and fall. Turn to one three one. This child wasn't is not worth this because so far I'm just losing health and this is how I'm probably gonna die. One three one. More washing lines and drying clothes break your fall as you plummet towards the ground. At the last minute, you manage to snag a line which slows your fall, but it still hurts. You hit the ground, lose another two health. Bruised and beaten, you stagger out of the alley. You are overwhelmed by hopelessness. You spy two guards and make your way towards them. Turn to number nine. Number nine, the guards stare blankly at you. Oh, look at that. Lovely. In a heightened state of anxiety, you explain about your missing coin purse. They seem all too familiar with your tale and know the culprit. We've been trying to catch him for weeks, but he's too fast for us. We know he comes up through the sewers, though. You would be doing us a favour if you went down there and got him. Just watch out for the other... things. They stare blankly at you. Clearly, they have no intention of going down themselves. Will you venture into the sewers to find the thief and to get your coin purse back? Or tell them about the raiders and beg them for help? No, I'm gonna go in. I've made enough. I've made bad decisions already. I might as well continue going. So, number seventeen. Desperation has led you to this point. What awaits you in these sewers is anyone's guess. But you must find the thief. You need the money to buy essential supplies for your journey to Fang Mountain. This is your first time in a sewer system. The tunnels here are a mix of brick and stone, and you can hear trickling water from the storm drains above you. The path you are on is next to a fast-flowing underground river carrying the city's waste away. You wouldn't want to go swimming in it. The way to the left is shrouded in darkness while the path to the right has lit torch... I guess that's sconces. I'm butchering so many things. At regular intervals and looks more inviting. If a sewer can look inviting. So will we go left into the darkness or right? I think right would be the safest option because there's light there and I think in the darkness we'll probably stumble and not be able to see what we're fighting. So we're going to go to 205. The tunnel is brightly lit and ends abruptly at a stout wooden door. You listen at it and hear a scratching sound from the other side followed by a clink and a shouted curse. Will you try and open the door or turn around and investigate the darker corridor? No, we're going to investigate this door before we go around. So turn to 21. A gnome sits at a desk, frantically trying to sponge spilled ink off a parchment. I'm since it's mentioned in pictures, there might be numbers on there. I'm kind of I'm trying to keep an eye out for them on the pictures, but so far nothing. To your surprise, the door swings open on well-oiled hinges. Inside, a gnome, or as my friend likes to call them, a gnome, sits at a desk, frantically trying to mop spilled ink off a parchment he was working on. Blast it, doesn't anyone ever knock? You scared the life out of me. You apologise and ask him what he's doing down here. I could ask you the same thing. I work here, at least I'm trying to work here. You explain you're chasing a thief, and the gnome clerk seems to soften. Oh, him. Well, good luck with that, I suppose. Those good-for-nothing guards sent you down, did they? Yes, of course they did. They won't come here on their own, terrified of the thing in the catacombs. Oh, don't worry, it never comes up this way. Whatever it is. Too busy eating all of the rats it can find, which is good in my book. Uh, have you made a note of the code word Argus? If you have, turn to 273 now. Otherwise, the gnome seems friendly and a possible source of information. Will you ask him about the thief? Turn to 421. Ask him about the thing in the catacombs or ask him about himself. No, my main focus so far is the thief, so I'm going to turn to 41. You'll only catch him if he wants to be caught, the gnome says. I've seen him a few times. He always gives me a wave. Friendly like that. Next thing I know, a quill is missing. Rounds. <laughs> Head back down the corridor and keep going where the torch scones run out. He likes to hang out in the darker areas of the sewer. The gnome shudders. If he likes the look of you, he'll make himself known. If you haven't already, will you ask him about the thing in the catacombs? I will ask him now, because now I'm a bit curious, because that seems to be where we're going. So I'm going to go to 296. 
as I said, it keeps the rats down, so it's okay in my book. But I have heard stories about people going missing, so maybe I shouldn't say that. If you follow the path to the reservoir in the catacombs, you can say hello. He looks at you. That was a joke. Don't do that. You'll die. Right, let's leave and search the dark corridor. Turn to 76. We need to make sure we don't go near the reservoir then. So, 76. Let's follow this thief. Grabbing a torch from a nearby sconce, scone, whatever you want to call it, you step into darkness. You follow the stone path as it twists and turns, following the rushing black water. It's very uneven and you are glad of the torch which stops you on more than one occasion from tripping into the river. From around the next corner you hear footsteps and raised voices. Is it the thief and a possible accomplice or someone else? There are certainly two people and they are having a heated argument. So we can either stand our ground and wait, douse our torch and hide in the shadows, or douse your torch and draw your rusty dagger. I am... Um, I don't think we should let the torch out because it stopped us from tripping in the water. That is the question. I'm going to stand my ground and wait. So, 166. Let's see if there's anything here, picture-wise. Goblins, squat, ugly characters. Are there any numbers at all? I do not see. The voices get closer. You can't make out the exact words being said over the rushing water but they sound as if they're about to come to blows. Two figures turn the corner and stop abruptly when they see you holding a torch. They're goblins. What ugly characters, with contorted faces and mouths full of broken yellow teeth. Their eyes bulge as if they recognise you. Their animosity seemingly forgotten. It is them, Drac! First goblin grunts. Drac snarls and punches the other goblin. Too young, Drac. But all look same to me. Kill anyway. Oh no. Here we go. With that, Drac and Drek draw their swords and attack you. Because of the narrow path, they can only fight you one at a time. So Drac has four health. So. We're fighting Drac. His attack is six. And its health is four. So, how this works is we both roll. I'm going to just do this because my health so far is... I'm going to do me. So, my attack at the moment is 10. And my health is at 11. So, let's do this. So, we roll both sets of dice. Let's just put this... So we roll both sets of dice, we add our attack numbers to them, whoever gets the highest is the winner of that round and they do two damage to the opponent. If you roll doubles like this, um, it's in, in, uh, instantly a critical, so you do four damage instead, so double the damage. So if we both get the same score, it's basically a clash of steel and, and no one gets hurt. So. Let's do this. Okay. So. So my attack. We've got a 6 and a 5. Which is 11 plus 10. So we've got 21. And they have 6 plus 6 which is 12. So I do 2 damage to Drac. Do that again. 5 and a 4. Which be 19. And he only gets 14. So... I kill Drac. Let's see what happens here. If you win, turn to 137. Drac cries out and falls to the path, his rusty curved sword clanging on the cobbles. It's not the best weapon, but better than yours. You could attempt to scoop it up before Drek clambers over his comrade and attacks. If you want to take it, roll two dice. If the total is equal or under agility, grab the sword. Our agility has been absolutely awful because we keep rolling too high. But let's try it. So. Our agility is seven. Let's see if we can do it. Thank you, Lord. We rolled a four. So we get it. 
You grab the sword and parry a blow from the second goblin as he leaps over his dead companion. We get a rusty sword. It is a plus two. Now, I did forget when we're adding our attack to add the plus damage. So, we're going to be fighting Drek. But Drek, his attack is the same, but his health is a little bit higher. Everything six for him is us. Quite look that our health hasn't gone down, to be honest. I just want to double check about this damage. Oh no, we do do extra damage with the sword. So it doesn't go to our attack. It is... We do extra to damage. So that is good to know. They didn't know that. So... Let's do this. So, I'm going to roll first. That's instantly... Let me just roll his as well. Yeah. So, we obviously rolled higher than Drek. And we've done a critical hit, which normally makes it 4 damage. But we have an extra plus 2. So, that instantly wipes him out. Is how I think that goes. If I've done that wrong, please let me know. Because I'm prone to make mistakes. So if we win, turn to one, eight, six. Both goblins lie dead. A quick search reveals six bronze pieces. Okay, this is good. One second. So we have six, a pen, six bronze pieces, a rusty sword, which we already have. And a strange animal tooth necklace. Let me take any or all of these items. I'm going to put that into my pack so far. So I'm just going to okay. make a scruffy little thing. So animal tooth necklace. One thought he recognized you. Were they looking for your father? But there's no time to ponder. You hear voices down the pitch black tunnel coming your way. More goblins. You have to act fast. Will you push the bodies into the water and hide in the shadows? Or stand your ground and confront them? I am going to push the bodies into the water and hide in the shadows. I'm turning to 288. The splashes are hidden by the rushing of the water. You douse your torch and step into the shadows in the semi-darkness. The blood stains are hidden. Two more goblins walk by. They are deep in conversation in a guttural language you don't understand. Passing by, they don't notice you and are soon lost from sight. Stepping out, you continue on your way. That was clever. No point in fighting if you don't have to, a voice, a voice says. Turn to 152. Oh. To your surprise, your coin purse is thrown at you. Add the 20 pieces. So we're at 26 now. Sorry, I took it. Please don't be angry. The thief steps out of the shadow, but close you see it isn't a boy at all, but a young girl. About the same age as your sister was before. Tears prick your eyes and you look away, your anger gone. I saw what you did to those Fang Mountain Raiders. They deserved it. Skulking about causing who knows what mischief, the thief girl says. He fishes out one of the strange animal tooth necklaces from a dead goblin. They all wear these. She wrinkles her nose in disgust. Take one. Raiders come in all shapes and sizes. Wear it at the right moment and you'd fit right in. That's if you plan on killing more, I suppose. She sniffs. Uh, we've already added the animal tooth necklace. Yeah. I, I didn't put it on because I didn't know if it did anything. So if you are already wearing it, you take it off in disgust. You don't know why, but you find yourself trusting her, and you blurt out your story. Easier than you thought it would be, as if it happened to someone else. When you finish, the thief girl looks up at you, studying your face. Raiders burned our home down, and took us to Fang Mountain. She frowns. They lined up my family. There was a hole in the air. Daddy told me not to look at it. He did, and it made him different. It scared the raiders and they killed him. That's when I ran away. I've always been good at running and hiding. I found my way to Winterheart and now I live down here. It's better than Fang Mountain. You feel a kind of kinship, this child, and admire her vigor. 
and will to survive. Proof that there is life for the lost gives you a renewed sense of hope and strengthens your resolve. Will you ask if she needs any help? Turn to 220. Tell her about your mission to seek vengeance on all raiders, or ask her for help getting into Fang Mountain. I think right now we're going to save and we will come back to this. But let me know what you think so far. If I've done anything wrong, please let me know. And uh, we will continue with this very, very soon. The giveaway for number three will be up very, very soon. And much love. Make good choices and be good to yourselves. Cheers.